and theoretically live. All right, anybody watching the recording of this afterwards, you can skip the first probably 10 minutes, maybe a little bit less than that. I will be talking about stuff in that first bit of time, but I won't be, you know, quote unquote, getting actually started. What the heck is this? Get this trash off the screen, please. Stop pushing hookers on YouTube. Uh, where are we going? Content. Live. Monetization on. But yeah, I'll be officially starting at like 10 minutes in or so. I get this. Set that to live chat. Dismiss this. Uh, oh, I'm already muted. Awesome. YouTube, YouTube's AI is actually like doing something decent. It remembered my settings, except for the fact that it doesn't start off in live chat, though. So that's plus one point, but also minus one point and minus one point for uh, promoting VTuber accounts. Uh, specifically promoting slutty VTuber accounts, apparently. Okay, uh, what do we need? We need Google Earth, as always. And as always, it's going to give us issues. Uh, where does that go? Uh, does this go to the... That's, that's just an icon. What are you doing? You're supposed to go to the channel. And this dude, what is this? Why are you, I have I have no idea. They suddenly like started throwing that dude in front of my face. Uh, okay. We need to be able to go here. We load. Here. And the Google Drive folder. So while we're in the waiting time to let everybody show up, uh, I can uh, show you guys uh, the link to this, like you just saw, is in the description of any of the latest few videos. So you go into the description of any of the videos and you click uh, this. And actually, I'll put it in the chat. I might as well. So yeah, I'll just go ahead and put it in the chat anyways. Uh, but that links you to this folder, which has all of these things that uh, this is what I do, you know, in my quote unquote free time when I'm not on when I'm not on or when I'm not actually making a video. Uh, so I've been doing all of these things, uh, which are stuff like, for example, these. Uh, I did actual up-to-date extensions of the uh, birth rate graphs that you'll find on Google if you Google any country's birth rate because uh, Google hasn't updated them for like four years now. So I decided to find I'll do it myself. So you got stuff like that. And now also you have uh, the latest one that I've been doing is rough future production graphs or projections of different countries future oil and or gas production only for like 10 to 15 years in the future for most of them because that's the time frame for which you can reliably project things based on what fields are in development but so there's a bunch of other stuff like that and there's still more other things i'm doing that i'm going to add there soon so for anybody who doesn't know that's there 24 7 uh, it's, you know, free. You can use it in like your own videos or anything if you want to. Uh, it's not like I could actually stop you from doing so anyways. All right. I have Google Earth ready. Let's get the bookmarks up. But, uh, the next one I will be working on is population projection graphs. My own, not, uh, somebody else's since, uh, as we, me, and you guys have both agreed, uh, me finding out you guys do agree with me, the 
current uh, UN projection, uh, population projections are really not accurate. Uh, like the global one, for example, literally still uh, assumes global population not peaking until like 2080 or 2090 and getting all the way up to like 10 and a half billion or something when we all know that is not what's going to happen. <clears throat> All right, how long have we been going for? Uh, five minutes. Okay, so we have a few minutes left. And I forgot to text Josh to make sure he can show up, if he wants to at least. There, there you go. Two character text. Uh, okay, do have it on live, so anybody can talk. Everything is working. Insert ad. No, that ain't me. No, sorry. Uh, not no, it's nah. Nah, brah, that ain't me. Uh, create highlight video. Add stream marker. Wow, you guys are getting fancy. Crazy good. Uh, crazy good what? The Google Doc stuff? Uh, that's super chat, like always. That's the engage thing, I think. Oh, yeah, the polls and the Q&A. Okay, the Q&A thing is kind of pointless because I respond to stuff anyways, at least when I remember to look at it. Uh, oh, yeah. Well, in the last few minutes before we officially start for real, for real, uh, we can go in here and see that uh, prices for many things have been actually finally correcting themselves towards the direction they should have been this entire time. So like copper, uh, as I've said, given the present supply and demand scenario and the one that we are heading into, copper should be close to five bucks. It should be in the upper fours, if not around five. And honestly, it should be starting to transit over five dollars. But it's been stubbornly hanging out under four for the last year. And the market, in quotation marks, has finally seemed like it might be getting the hint as we're doing one, now two, uh, spike stair steps upwards. So finally back up over four where it definitively belongs uh, and now climbing up towards hopefully the upper fours where it really belongs at a minimum. Uh, currently now up to just under $4.22 per pound. And uh, oil finally heading up towards 90 or so, which is where it should have been all this time. Uh, this this whole year, it still should have been around 90. Uh, it's only now jumping up here because of the escalation stuff in the Middle East now. And because uh, Russia has finally... Uh, cemented in those additional production cuts that they said they were going to do. Uh, they just uh, didn't do them for like two or three months, but now they are dialing that stuff down. Uh, so now that stuff is finally coming in here, even though, like I said, it could have been up towards 90 this whole time. And then silver is lunging upwards into the upper 20s, uh, heading towards the 30s, which is where it should have been all this time. And honestly, right now, in its in its uh, supply situation that it's in, should be in the upper 30s, close to 40. Uh, now it's up to $27.20 or so. Uh, however, unfortunately, this is predominantly uh, political and financially motivated. It's not the market recognizing the supply deficit reality. It's just... Uh, investors panicking about something, something, the Federal Reserve and the the interest rates uh, and wanting something uh, to appreciate in value more uh, as opposed to, I don't know, what their, their regular bank account money would. So unfortunately, uh, like it never is until it's too late and it hits a brick wall, uh, it's not the market actually recognizing anything. Uh, downloads actually go here uh, to show the concept. So 
in theory, if the market was directly tied to supply and demand, uh, just that push and pull, it would have done something like this over the course of time, or it would since, you know, this is 2024. Uh, and eventually towards the later uh, 2020s, it would end up around like 70 or $80 per ounce of silver. However, instead, the market has constantly signaled that this is what it wants to do. Just ignore reality until it can't and it slams face first into a brick wall, which would see at the last possible minute when a actual physical deficit surfaces, it would see prices lunge up into triple digits. However, now it looks like they might uh, because of other factors, but, you know, still they might go into a range that they should have been in. Uh, but we'll see because, you know, we had hopeful signals like that before that then fell apart. And uh, gold is not really in a supply crunch like silver is. Uh, gold's stuff is basically entirely financially motivated uh but in this case that like honestly is slash should be its driver because it's it's there is enough gold on hand but uh as i said in that video before this is not a record high price for gold despite the fact that if you look back this is nominally higher than the uh the price that was set in 2011 of 1823 however that 1823 dollars back in 2011 uh inflation adjusted would be the equivalent of uh over 2500 dollars today so value adjusted gold has not actually broken its record yet uh it's looking like it might uh and uh I was expecting sometime this decade uh, because of not necessarily because of supply stuff, because uh, gold won't we uh, gold won't have a major drop like that, like silver did just yet. Uh, there is enough gold boom coming supply wise to keep the table at around thirty five hundred tons per year for like another decade and a half or so. Uh, although our demand is starting to stretch beyond that. Uh, by all means, it is going a bit higher than that. However, the gold inventories that were built up during uh, the COVID demand crash for jewelry are still pretty huge. Uh, but still, because of the financial uh, spook factor from all of the things that are already happening this decade and are still going to happen, uh, gold is probably going to lunge up into the threes, uh, possibly up towards like 4,000 uh, sometime during this decade. Uh, once or twice, uh, maybe more than that, but it will have like uh, lunges upward like that towards that area. Uh, but because of the spook factor, because of things happening. But anyways, it is probably, oh, it's well past time to start. Okay, sorry. Uh, sorry, guys, uh, for delaying. Oh, yes, it is Josh's birthday today, uh, April 3rd. Uh, Josh is now 30, just like me. Well, except he's only 30. I'm 30.6 as of, uh, yeah, I, I think rounded, I would be 30.6 right now. So uh, slowly, my organs are failing and my bones are decaying. Uh, we are going through the process. But now that we're here and it's time, so things in the Middle East after all the Israel stuff that uh, you can catch in the screen recordings from back in October and November. After all the stuff in the invasion of Gaza, uh, things actually kind of quieted down and just like uh, went into a meandering pattern for the last couple weeks, even couple months, until just recently so now uh israel has suddenly uh started ramping up its bombings in lebanon uh preempting things for their you know obvious very telegraphed upcoming invasion of southern lebanon and even uh in the occupied golan heights region uh let me see if i can scroll down and find that one 
excuse me, scroll down when I tell you to scroll down. Uh, blah, blah, blah. Uh, well, yeah, there's the meeting they just held uh, about the upcoming, quote-unquote, attack maneuvers because they're not going to call it an invasion because uh, calling it an invasion, you know, makes you seem like the bad guy. Uh, so they're calling it an attack maneuver. Oh, here we go. Okay. So uh, here was the update. Uh, they are... Uh, Israel is dismantling and deactivating their minefields that they placed up in this area uh, so that they can launch their invasion like around in a hook like this, come up through their occupied Golan region and swing into southern Lebanon like this, as opposed to going directly across the border, because going directly across the border uh, would go through like a bunch of stuff that Hezbollah has likely set up uh, in expectation of them crossing the border and not just like recently, but stuff that they probably had set up like minefields and stuff for years or decades. So they're going to do a swing around motion uh, to skip around all of that. And uh, obviously to do that, they do have to actually get rid of their own minefields that they have up here first. And they are in the presence in the, uh, uh, they are in the process. That's the word I'm looking for. See, my brain is failing from old age. Uh, they are in the process of doing that right now, which, uh, you know, makes you think, OK, it's it's coming soon enough then. So uh, and we did fulfill the time frame that uh, I projected or expected, because, you know, once they officially like they just flat out announced that they're going to do it, uh, like I said, back in January, uh after that first announcement came out, you guys remember I said, uh, uh, you know, this is a much bigger thing than just storming into Gaza. Uh, and Hezbollah is not Hamas. Hezbollah is uh, much closer to a military organization. So uh, this would need a lot more actual careful consideration and planning beforehand. And thus, I was uh, expecting, unlike the two weeks of prep before invading Gaza, that invading southern Lebanon wouldn't be seen for like probably at least two months. And so I I think I specifically said like it would definitely not happen before like the very end of March. So now we're past the very end of March as expected into the beginning of April. And now that we're, you know, past the time frame of, you know, it probably wouldn't happen before then. Now we're immediately tipping into, oh, hey, look, it's probably about to happen because now they're removing the minefield so that they can hook swing. Uh, and that's not all. As uh, they've also been conducting bombings in Damascus, one of the more recent ones of which uh, scroll down, scroll down. Uh, was that? No, that's that's too far past it, I think. Right. Uh, where was it? I'm afraid. Oh, there it is. Okay, I was worried it might only be a text post. So, uh, these three dudes, uh, three generals, another three generals, uh, Iranian generals, not Syrian generals, uh, another three Iranian generals uh, were taken out in this bombing of the Iranian uh, consulate or Iranian em embassy in Damascus. I'm pretty sure it was Damascus. It might have been a different Syrian city. Uh, but so that brings Iran's total uh, losses to, I think, seven generals killed now in the last few months since all the Israel stuff started back in October. So, you know, that's really not good uh, to be losing, uh, you know, your experienced uh, top brass members that quickly, especially. And uh, taking out three in one go here, along with there was something uh, like a dozen uh, a dozen colonels or colonel equivalent uh, ranks with them in this meeting that was going on. Uh, and there is uh, there is controversy in Iran. There is actual like like outcry in like the Islamic Revolution Party or whatever they call themselves. There is actual like infighting and questioning going on right now of like why. 
why were we so stupid? Why did we just put all these guys in this one room within like strike range of, of the, the IDF? Uh, and they're being told, of course, uh, shut up. Uh, don't question, uh, don't question the regime because that's what the regime, you know, will always tell you. Uh, but so apparently, uh, this was too big of a blow and, uh, this has actually pissed Iran off, or at least that's the, the, that's the, the stage face. Uh, in reality, it's an excuse. Uh, now, unlike what some people will say, no, I, I really, I highly doubt they like intentionally let their, their generals get killed to have an excuse. Uh, but they are jumping on it as an excuse, uh, a decent, a decent enough justification. Uh, they feel to, in their words, uh, they made, uh, they made a whole, you know, like angry revenge speech about how they will make Israel pay. And, uh, what they mean by that is being left ambiguous. Uh, the last time they said that, uh, they attacked a, uh, they launched a ballistic, mi ballistic missile strike on a U.S. base in Iraq. Uh, this time, uh, they've said they're actually going to strike, uh, something Israeli Israeli as opposed to just Israel adjacent, like, uh, friends and allies in the region. So there's speculation about that, uh, that they might, uh, have one of their proxies, like, suicide bomb an Israeli embassy in one of the uh, the Arab nations that have normalized relations with Israel, uh, that they might uh, actually launch a uh, long-range uh, cruise missile or ballistic missile attack at uh, one or more Israeli uh, naval vessels in the Red Sea. Uh, the Israeli Navy is not that large, but they do have uh, they do have uh, several. Uh, I, I do believe they they have several uh, cruise missile or, or guided missile uh, capable frigates. Uh, so they do have assets to be lost if Iran were to succeed in its hits. Uh, so a lot of people are, uh, or at least uh, a lot of those commenting from the actual uh, liaison to the press uh, liaison to the press group from like intelligence agencies think that that is what Iran's angle will be because that's like the most likely thing they could have a chance at succeeding at hitting because for one, uh, for one, actually, firstly, they, they could get away with it. They know that, uh, they could strike those and by get away with it, I don't mean have zero repercussions by get away with it. I mean, uh, they could hit if they managed to hit and sink one or two of Israel's naval vessels and we, Again, me speaking on behalf of the U.S., uh, we wouldn't do anything. Uh, Israel certainly would. But uh, Israel, despite how uh, adored and like uber hyped up they are by the American right, is not actually capable of like annihilating Iran on its own, short of using nukes, at least. Uh, what Iran's like, main thing is with constantly holding itself back is they do not want us to uh, turn against them in actual military action. So they know they could like sink a ship or two belonging to Israel uh, and we wouldn't do anything. Israel definitely would. They would probably carry out strikes within Iran, uh, which they're capable of. They've done that before. Uh, again, partially that was at our behest a few years back. They sent in, uh, they used the F-35s and, uh, they, they used the F-35s and they struck several, uh, suicide drone factories that were like, uh, just inside of Iran in the Western regions. And that was sort of at our behest, one, to help Ukraine by lowering the amount of Shahids Iran could produce for Russia and two, to test out the F-35s stealth on uh, radar and SAM systems uh, that, in Iran's case, are primarily ones from uh, from Russia that Russia uses. So we wanted uh, to, you know, test those out a bit uh, and, you know, make sure the F-35 is indeed invisible, uh, radar-wise at least. 
and uh, they, you know, they pulled that off multiple times. So yes, it was undetected. So we got what they want. We got what we wanted. Uh, Israel probably didn't get what it wanted because it, you know, would have wanted to like uh, go ham crazy. But uh, they can, you know, get to Iran uh, and especially uh, do like the glided bombs from a distance stuff. They can, you know, not even have to actually cross the Iranian border uh, or uh, launch uh, long range air to ground missiles that, you know, have something like 200 mile range. So Israel would definitely retaliate against them. However, uh, we wouldn't, which is where the key idea behind attacking Israel's naval assets is probably what Iran wants to do. Whether this materializes and they actually do it remains to be seen, though. Uh, as the, the only other options would be, uh, like I said, maybe uh, using suicide bombers to like bomb an Israeli embassy in some country. Probably they would want to do like the Israeli embassy or consulate in uh, any of the Arab countries specifically that have normalized relations with Israel because they'd want to also send a message to them too. But uh, the like third and least likely option, I'm not saying they won't do this, but the least likely one is launching like an actual ballistic missile barrage at Israel itself, which they have. Iran's arsenal is enough to where they could launch enough at once to actually like get through Israel's air defense umbrella. And they would actually hit things and and destroy things and cause damage. Uh, so they are capable of that if they want to. However, if they actually do that and like strike Israel itself, as opposed to just like an Israeli naval vessel or two down in the Red Sea or something like that, then that stands too high of a chance of tipping us into taking military action against them which the regime is still, for the moment, it seems, uh, not stupid enough to bring that down on itself. Although they might get that stupid as time goes on. And also, uh, you know, I've, I've said uh, all the stuff about Azerbaijan's eventual invasion of southern Armenia and the fact that's going to draw Iran against Azerbaijan and then Turkey against Iran. Well, one of Iran's uh, top guys is going crazy. Uh, he is like, uh, you know, starting to pull like some Trump Twitter moments, some Kim Jong Un speech moments, and apparently, I guess he just wants to jumpstart this war right then, right now, because uh, of all the potential, you know, Israeli targets, he did pick an embassy, and his specific uh, choi choice in his, you know, angry revenge speech was. Let's bomb Baku. Let's bomb. Uh, let's you know level the Israeli embassy and uh, everything around it in Baku, up in Azerbaijan. Uh, you know, I, I guess in I guess maybe he sees all this, and in his mind, he's just like, well, let's just get it started right here and now. Let's rumble, ring the bell. Uh, so, and when that starts, like I've said, uh, that will then draw Turkey against them, and that. Uh, Israel will jump on that uh, on that uh, attempt, not for the sake of helping Turkey uh, or helping Azerbaijan, but just for the sake of knocking Iran out. Uh, the same reason that Turkey will be jumping on that, not like really to help Azerbaijan, because they don't actually care, uh, but they do want to knock Iran out uh, because. Uh, no, nobody likes this whole four power players arrangement in the Middle East and North Africa region of Iran, Turkey, Israel, and Saudi Arabia. Not that Saudi Arabia is actually a military power. It likes to pretend to be, and it uses its money to basically paint fake muscles on itself. Uh, so don't actually include Saudi Arabia in that. Uh, they're, they are a pretend military power financially in the region. But uh, none, no, nobody likes the four power arrangement. So everybody, you know, wants to get rid of at least one of their competitors and basically 
it's kind of an unspoken situation of Saudi Arabia, Israel, and Turkey kind of all agree with each other that, you know, uh, let's just, let's, let's make Iran the, the first pick. Let's chop them out first. Uh, then we can have at each other sometime later. So they all want Iran dead. So if Turkey were to jump in uh, after the whole Azerbaijan, Armenia, Iran intervenes thing, Israel would then, by all means, uh, take every opportunity at that and uh, uh, probably use blah, 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 Iran's doing human rights violations, which by all means they would be uh, as a cover, uh, as, you know, a, a vague political reason cover, and they would start uh, bombing Iran as well. And Iran would, uh, especially in the state it's pushed itself into now, Iran would, or rather will, because this inevitably is coming, uh, crumble under the whole scenario. Uh, they will not win that fight. Uh, they will crumble. Uh, the Azeri portions in the northwest will eventually join Azerbaijan, and Azerbaijan will probably then leave Armenia alone afterwards and use this, like, as and uh, use their taking the Azeri portions of Iran instead of in, instead of actually taking southern Armenia as a like facade excuse about how see how benevolent they are uh and then uh also the Balochistan portion of Iran will break off which is already happening uh that's one of the latest things I had bookmarked here uh was this the lower one or the top one but stop doing this. Put it on the whole thing. Okay, so, uh, yeah, two uh, Iranian Revolutionary Guard bases in uh, uh, and a, a weapons depot in southern uh, southeastern Iran, Balochistan. And just like the Baha'i people who aren't really concentrated, they kind of live scattered about. Uh, but they've wanted independence for a while. And now that Iran is uh, self-crippling, uh, they, you know, kind of smell blood in the water. So they're jumping on that. And uh, so this is their biggest thing they've done yet. Uh, attacking two bases at once and uh, and seizing a bunch of like actual military equipment from a from a weapons depot. Uh, so they've been doing like random firefight engagements with the the IRG and doing a few bombings, but uh, this is like the biggest thing they've done yet. So it is starting to actually simmer and boil uh, down in Iranian uh, Balochistan. Uh, but so eventually, in the near enough future, Balochistan will finally be free. Uh, and uh, the Azeri portions of Iran will also finally be free. Uh, you know, that is a, a nuanced, tangled scenario with the whole, you know, Azerbaijan aggression towards Armenia thing. But I do also, at the same time, you know, want the Azeri people up in this portion of Iran that have been repeatedly suppressed by the Iranian regime to be free and no longer suppressed by suppressed by the Iranian regime. Uh, and the Kurds, of course, especially. Okay. Uh, but so Iran is gearing up to potentially do something. Uh, again, everyone seems to think likely they're just going to try to sink like one or two Israeli naval vessels uh, because that's like what they feel they could most get away with. But they might just jump off the deep ends. Uh, who knows? Uh, check chat. Uh, chat is dead. Okay, so chat is dead, then continue. Okay, so uh, we'll jump into Russia and Ukraine after we uh, do a bit of a runaround uh, other updates uh, from different countries. Uh, Tunisia. Some decent news out of Tunisia. Uh, apart from them gradually regaining water level at their reservoirs, uh, further economic revamp is uh, coming for Tunisia, as now 
I forgot which city or which like uh, area it's being built in, uh, but a another automotive uh, wiring factory is being constructed in Tunisia. This is actually the third. Uh, I believe there's like one from uh, each one is from a different uh, auto manufacturer, uh, but they are getting another factory there specifically uh, manufacturing uh, the like automobile uh, wiring. A wiring set, a wiring structure, uh, because electrical uh, electrical work stuff is uh, the particular mechanical or manufacturing area that uh, Tunisia has the most uh, stuff in. And then Mexico continues to be the nearshoring winner, uh, as uh, I, you know, kind of saw the obvious that they would be, whereas Peter Zion, apparently the guy everyone was like quoting for a while for the last two years, but now it's kind of dying out. Uh he kept saying that everyone was gonna pick Columbia for some reason. Uh so I don't know what he was smoking, but no, it, they were gonna pick Mexico. And they are picking Mexico. Uh so another tire manufacturing plant uh is coming up in Mexico now. And not as like critically societally important, but another uh, soda, as in as in you know the drink, uh, you know like cans of soda, another soda mixing slash canning slash bottling factory is also now being built in Mexico by one of the soda companies. Uh, not as like foundationally important, but still will employ a bunch of people. Uh, so ultimately good. Uh, and where else is it going to go? Uh, probably after Bandy Cam. Up here. Uh, I think. Yeah, so uh, this site that I am looking at on the screenshot, let me show you, is uh, the EIA's uh, hourly. U.S. grid load demand uh, tracker, uh, for example, right now, 6 p.m. Eastern time, uh, demand load on the grid is, or sorry, uh, 7 p.m. Uh, technically currently in uh, Eastern time, but at 6 p.m. because it's an hour update delayed. Uh, at 6 p.m., demand load on the grid was 445 gigawatts. And you can see how it fluctuates through different times of day. And then uh, you come down here and it shows the uh, different sources and you can track them. And uh, this is where you can see how ultimately useless solar is because, you know, you watch this, there's nothing. You have a couple hours here of barely anything as it builds up to its grand finale here at the height, where for three, maybe four hours, you know, if it's a if it's a really decent day, you get the actual nameplate capacity of your solar power production, and then boom, 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 down drop. It precipitates into nothing again. So, if if you have like a solar power setup, uh, a solar you know field, uh, and it's like, oh, this generates a hundred megawatts of solar of solar power. <clears throat> Uh, you probably, upon hearing the daytime, nighttime criticism, would assume, uh, you know, it only generates 100 uh, megawatts, 100 megawatts of electricity for 12 hours of the day. No, that's not the case. Uh, it only generates 100 megawatts of electricity for about three, maybe four hours of the day at sun high. In reality, uh, the four hours on either side of those middle four is it gradually climbing up through nothing numbers and then gradually falling back down through nothing numbers. So, yes, solar is useless. Uh, we need to get over this obsession. Uh, do they come close here? No. Okay, but so uh, this green one is wind. And I captured uh, these screenshots to show this. Uh, this was the record high uh, for U.S. wind power generation. 
uh, during one specific hour back uh, late in the evening of March 24th, uh, the U.S. was receiving about 97 or 98 gigawatts of electricity from wind turbines uh, because of a storm front that was sweeping across the country. And then you see how it just like comes and dives down as another period where it comes up nowhere near as high, but still kind of high. And then it dives down. Uh, like here, then it dives down, then it comes up middle way, then it dives down. So uh, wind is actually decent. It can give decent amounts. However, for one, like I said, you should only employ it where there is eternal wind, not where you in a personal anecdote are going to respond to that by telling me where I live, it's windy a lot. I mean where there is eternal wind, uh, in which there are only a few specific places on Earth where that is the case, uh, like Denmark and uh, uh, Schleswig-Holstein, Germany, uh, that, that whole area in between the North Sea and Baltic Sea. Uh, it also includes like some of the southern tip of Norway and uh, Sweden. Uh, that area is one of the few areas on Earth uh, in between those two seas, that passageway. There, there is actually eternal wind, as in once you go about 30 meters up off the ground, it never stops. Uh, some other areas include uh, some other areas include a very specific portion of Nebraska, Iowa, uh, Kansas, and Missouri. I, I believe it's it's like a square right around here. Or it might not include parts of Missouri. It might be a little shifted over and upward like that. Uh, there is a specific square right around here, I believe, uh, where the Great Plains area is windy very frequently, but it's not eternal wind. Except for this one particular area, like I said, I think it's right around here. Uh, this one particular square oddity for some reason, actually does have eternal wind. Uh, and uh, like right up here near the mouth of, this is Lake Ontario. This one's Lake Ontario and the bottom one's Lake Erie, right? Where's the top one, Lake Erie? Are you going to tell me which lake this is? Okay, thank you. Uh, so up here uh, around these islands, there is eternal wind. And then uh, if you go out here off the coast of like Cape Cod, where I grew up uh, from age zero to 12, and uh, especially along the shore of Nova Scotia and all over the island of Newfoundland, uh, there is eternal wind. And then uh, there's, there's other places like uh, the one other I'll mention, I guess, is uh, the Dardanelles, the... Uh, Marmara area here, uh, there, uh, in in and over the sea itself, and these portions of land around it between the Black Sea and Aegean Sea, uh, because of that narrow chute passage uh, here along this area is eternal wind. So, uh, wind can actually be a a very decent source if you employ it where there is eternal wind. Oh, yeah, I forgot. Uh, all along, like, especially the northern shorelines, uh, the more northern shore portions of Scotland, uh, there is also eternal wind. Uh, at least those are the ones that I uh, can mention off the top of my head at the moment. Uh, so, but uh, the point here, U.S. did set a wind power generation record, but then the wind power, you know, wobbled back down towards not really being all that much because that's what it does. Now, what we actually need to do is get this purple line higher, uh, which we supposedly are doing uh, because Congress did uh, pass that furthering nuclear thing recently, which uh, supposedly means we are going to, uh, not that all the reactors would be finished by then, we are supposedly going to uh, build, I believe it was uh, 20 additional gigawatts of nuclear power generation capacity uh, by 2040. Uh, now, 
Uh, because of usual delays, those reactors will probably be finished in like the early 2040s, not actually before 2040. But still, uh, that would take U.S. nuclear capacity from about 100 in total. It is down at the moment because uh, this is refueling season for a lot of reactors. Uh, but that would take it up to 120 for like the most ultimate stable base load, as you can see how perpetually flat it is. So that was a thing that happened. And then what else do we have on here? Oh, yeah. Over here in Iraq, the Kirkuk oil field, or rather the uh, second half of it, which has been out of production, the second half at least, since the ISIS attacks and the war on ISIS uh, back in 2014 through 2017. Uh, all that stuff has finally been repaired, and so the second half of it is finally going to come back into production, or rather, sorry, it is in the process of being brought back online right now, and that will be adding uh, between 125 and 175,000 barrels per day of production onto uh, Iraq's current total, which, like I said, you know, is already in disobedience of their, their mandated OPEC cut numbers. They are supposed to be down at 3.8. However, uh, they're fluctuating between 4.1 and 4.2, before which they were holding 4.3. Uh, and then they kind of snubbed Saudi Arabia's orders by saying, okay, well, we will cut by 200,000 from the 4.3 that we're holding right now that we're not supposed to be at. Uh, so this is now going to just jump them right back up to like 4.25. And then uh, they'll go up from that probably in the next like year or so once they finally decide they're done even pretending to like half comply with Saudi Arabia's orders anymore because they are essentially done with that. Uh, and next year or 2026 is when is when uh, one of the. Uh, redevelopments and expansions is finished uh, down near Basra in one of their larger fields that will be adding another 200,000 onto that. And uh, they have about another 200,000 that's only offline because of uh, taxation disagreements with Turkey about like how much of a cut Turkey gets from uh, the oil transiting through Turkey to a, a tanker port so over here or something. So uh, I believe uh, Iraq now is just uh, going to be expanding their own uh, tanker terminal uh, so that they don't have to, like, send anything through anybody else. Uh, but so all of that combined, uh, that would be uh, plus the, the 200 that they cut uh, to pretend to comply uh, would be. 4.45 plus the 200 coming online for that expansion will be 4.65 plus the 200 that's, you know, offline because of that political disagreement would be 4.85 uh, by, say, the end of next year if uh, everything were switched on as intended. And then there is that large uh, thousand foot plus thick uh, oil bearing sandstone layer that was discovered in some of that drilling here back in, I think, 2020 or 2019. Uh, that's expected to be getting brought into production soon enough. And minimum 200,000, probably, but potentially up to 600,000 barrels per day from that. So, you know, that would be the big fiver that throws them up and over along with all the various expansions and revitalizations to all of their old fields that were perpetually damaged uh, from the wars and from ISIS, and all of the exploration in this whole area, about 40% of the country still has never actually had actual oil and gas exploration undertaken in it. So that's why I uh, have repeatedly, you know, told you guys out of the Persian Gulf nations, Iraq is actually going to be the last one standing. All right, who else do we have? Or what else do we have for anything here? Uh, 
Uh, Somalia continues progressing against the shrinking remnants of al-Shabaab and other uh, militant groups. Uh, they had another successful push against them recently, uh, surrounded and wiped out 80 uh, militant group members in one particular operation. Uh, so they are now in the, like, act. they're now in seemingly the final phase of cleansing the country of uh, the, you know, different militant and terrorist groups that have plagued it for so long. And also, we have Poland. Polska is throwing, uh, is continuing to punch above their weight in various different ways. Uh, recently now, uh, they have just completed uh, their own, uh, their own uh, canal, their own uh, breakthrough thing, ship transit lane right around here, uh, which means they can now bring their own ships in through here without having to come in through here around uh, this break, which means they have to go through Russian waters and uh, pay tolls and stuff to the Russian Maritime Service. They have completed a, a canal breakthrough here, and so now they will be able to bring uh, ships and stuff in through here on their own. Uh, without needing to go around there. And also, the Poles are the ones uh, leading the anti-Kessler syndrome charge. For those who are unaware, uh, I spoke about this in the uh, future you'll actually see video. So, uh, Kessler syndrome is when uh, you have so many objects in orbit and so much debris from those objects and from launching them into orbit and from their collisions with each other that uh, things become uh, most hugely unmanageable and you have freak uh, collisions and stuff become so frequent that you have constant uh, damage and disruption to like your satellite networks and extremely high risks to actually like getting anything into orbit and uh to the point that like you would have to be launching much heavier stuff you'd have to literally have a like impacting shield around the the payload fairing around the uh the capsule that you're launching into orbit to protect it and its payload uh as it like climbs through a cloud of stuff that it's inevitably going to be having like dozens of impacts with objects with on its path up to its orbit. So uh, Kessler syndrome is undesirable, but uh, galaxy brain geniuses like Elon Musk, who are like putting up a thousand Starlink satellites a month uh, are, you know, throwing us towards this and people are cheering it on. Like it's a good thing. Uh, but uh, we, we already are, running risks because we've started losing track of a lot of like pieces that are broken off of stuff. However, the poles have been working in not necessarily secret, but no one was paying attention. So kind of secret to the common person, the poles were working in secret engineering uh, and accounting for, for atmospheric effects. Uh, they've been engineering a ground-based uh, scatter laser system that, uh, but we're, oh, yeah, uh, it was an image here, uh, that will constantly, uh, flicker, uh, different types of, uh, lasers, specifically, uh, specifically tuned to, uh, non visible, uh, frequencies, uh, so that they won't, like, interfere with pilots or anything, uh, or with aviation. Uh, but they, uh, will be, like, constantly spray flickering upwards with uh, just enough uh, just enough power to make sure that they will reach up and they will reflect off of anything they strike uh the guarantee is detection of things down to 10 centimeters of size uh with a strong probability uh, i forgot what percentage but it's still a strong probability of detecting things between like 4 or 5 centimeters up to 10 and then the uh, probability of uh, managing to catch and detect it 
lower than that uh, drops off pretty fast. Uh, but they are wanting to test this system soon, uh, which will hopefully allow us to find and pinpoint, you know, a lot of the actual broken off fragments of uh, space junk and stuff that we've, you know, lost track of over time because we had no real way to keep track of it. And uh, constantly uh, finding it, you know, getting hits off of it every time it like passes around uh, a few times each night over the course of several nights would eventually, you know, allow us to compute uh, each, a like trajectory for each of the, the individual, uh, not necessarily micro objects, but effectively compared to what we are able to track in orbit, they're effectively micro objects, they're micro debris. Uh, we'd be able to actually get an actual uh, computer like trajectory map for all of that stuff so that we would then uh, know when like risk moments would be for impacts with orbiting satellites and the like. So uh, that is uh, coming out of Poland. Now we switch over to uh, other big stuff, Russia and Ukraine. Uh, so, I possibly, but where am I? Oh, yeah, go back here for bookmarks. <clears throat> uh, so, uh, Russia has uh, developed a new, uh, new strategy and uh, presented new evidence for them not likely having as many uh, AFVs or IFVs, infantry uh, fighting vehicles, remaining as they claim, because they have now begun using literally golf carts on the front line. This is not a joke. Uh, not sure how far down I'd have to go for it. Uh, but uh, they've, uh, and I don't mean like the, the, little kind though that like you literally see on golf courses uh they're they're kind they're basically they look like uh a mix between those and like an an atv that like redneck uh rednecks would use down in the uh the american south uh but you know they're they're resorting to these uh for their like there they are Okay, uh, I can't play the video because people die in this video, and that's TOS, but uh, there they are. These are literally golf carts. Desert Cross golf carts. So uh, they're using golf carts for their, you know, kamikaze charges uh, across the front lines. So, you know, Russia is totally a superpower. It's it's totally legit. and. Uh, this strategy has gotten them uh, a lot of dead people, as one would expect. And look over here uh, for all the other stuff. Uh, so they're resorting to that, uh, giving bigger and bigger hints that their AFV, IFV, uh, you know, reserves aren't really all that numerous as they otherwise theoretically should be, especially if you were generously assuming that all the old, like, Soviet uh, era equipment, just like sitting out in those empty military lots, would easily be reactivatable. Turns out when you leave a bunch of stuff just sitting in the middle of Siberia for 50 years, most of it doesn't actually start back up when you try to use it again. So, uh, and also, uh, also, yeah, there were more. Uh, there were more refinery strikes. Uh, one was on the refinery in uh, Saratov, uh, not Saratov itself, I think, but it was like over here or something. Uh, but the refinery, a refinery in Saratov, was struck, and now proving the uh, even further range than. Uh, even further than uh, pro-Ukrainian people were initially claiming for the range of uh, Ukraine's uh, suicide drones, uh, they have been able to strike all the way in Tartarstan now. 
As yesterday, they struck an oil refinery over here in interior Tatarstan, and they also struck, uh, I believe I should have this bookmarked here. All right, uh, that was the aircraft down in. Uh, okay, well, that's, uh, uh, this isn't uh, Tatarstan, this is, uh, where's Yekaterinburg? Oh, wait, okay, that's even farther. Uh, so there was also Yekaterinburg, although wait, I think that was one of the, I think that was one of the Russian L's where they just exploded on their own. That might have been one of the ones where they just exploded. Uh, but this, uh, this was one of the, uh, uh, this was one of the plants where, uh, the old Soviet era vehicles that could be restored, uh, get brought to, to be like restored into workable condition. Uh, so that's, I, I'm pretty sure that one was not actually a drone strike. That one just exploded all by itself. Uh, just like the refinery in, uh, Nizhny Novgorod. Uh, but the one in the factory in Tatarstan, uh, where's that one? Oh yeah. Uh, here it was, uh, different portions of, uh, several buildings attached to this factory in Tatarstan, uh, which was the Ural factory. Which was the uh, one factory making Russia's uh, military supply trucks, of which they're only able to pump out twelve a month. So, you know, that was uh, uh, not any more of those. Then, okay, uh, looks like that's done. <clears throat> What else do we have here? Oh, I should probably check chat, like responsible streamer. Ooh, thank you. Cash money. Thank you. Uh, and then we go. Oh, yeah. Okay, that's not in a bookmark. We have to go to the site for that. Now, hopefully they don't put any skanky ads on. Okay. Uh, just child abuse prevention month. All right, that is that is the opposite of a a skanky ad. Okay. Uh, so Russia, uh, kind of without making a big announcement out of it, uh, raised their retirement age. You know, they have previously played on the whole, uh, you know, family oriented and providing for like their old people thing. But they've been gradually creeping it up, and now that uh, they are, you know, starting to run themselves on on the funding there, uh, with how much they're just dumping on on the Ukraine war, uh, they've kicked up their retirement age again. Uh, this time from sixty one and a half up to sixty three years old for men, and uh, for women. Previously, women could retire at fifty six and a half. Now, women. I uh, have to wait till 58 to retire. So, uh, sort of covertly, not not like literally covertly, but sort of covertly, sort of sneakily uh, went about that. Uh, and also, uh, Ukraine hit in... Uh, Crimea, they hit the actual communications and intel center for the Black Sea Fleet. So, uh, now the Black Sea Fleet is actually just literally being kept in Novorossiysk and hasn't even been moving around. And Russia is putting random barges in front of the, uh, the military Novosov, uh, Novorossiysk harbor entrance uh, to try to blockade it against any uh, Ukrainian surface uh, water suicide drones in case Ukraine uh, decides to attack the fleet in Novorossiysk. So uh, they've apparently at least clearly accepted the reality that uh, they're, they no longer have any legitimate uh, naval control or even naval presence there anymore. And so remember, 
uh, that Russia had six of those uh, landing vessels, uh, you know, large, uh, large amphibious landing ships uh, that carry like a bunch of equipment and stuff from one port to another. Uh, they were using those to transport stuff to and from Crimea and uh, to and from uh, ports along the southern portion here uh, because they could not keep using the rail lines in southern Ukraine because uh, uh, Ukrainian the uh, Ukrainian Secret Service kept blowing those up uh, or kept using like cutting charges on them. So the railway has been dead for months. So Russia, or actually it's been more than a year at this point. So Russia was having to use those uh, landing ships to carry supplies and vehicles across the Sea of Azov. And you might wonder why at first. Why would they do that? They have the carriage bridge. They could just roll them across, either on a train or, or across the bridge itself. Well, uh, since the bridge can be struck, since you guys probably remember from last year and 2022, it's been struck several times uh, by storm shadows and scout missiles. So to avoid making the bridge a target for as long as they could, at least, because if the bridge actually got taken out and Russia had to uh, literally evacuate Crimea via barge, uh, like via ferries, that would be... Image-wise, domestic image-wise, that would be catastrophic. So to keep fire away from the bridge, they started using uh, those transport vessels. However, those have been hit one by one by two by one by two by one. Uh, and so five got sunk. One was getting repaired. and. Uh, couple of weeks back, Ukraine hit the one that was getting repaired. Uh, so, you know, maybe it could still be repaired again, again, in another like six months from now. But uh, I don't really think so. So that's the lander fleet gone. So now they are having to use the bridge to transport stuff, which means the bridge is now back online as a target. And we are all uh, happy, ready posting, uh, and uh, all eyes are on it because now we know it's coming. Because that's that's the only way they have left to transport stuff there. So you know, there, there's nothing else to deflect the fire to. Okay, what else do we have on here? All right, in terms of numbers, uh, cruise missiles, uh, Russia started with an inventory of about 4,000, and given their production numbers, assuming that their manufacturing plants have been running at maximum efficiency all year, uh, all since the war started, which is doubtful, uh, and accounting for the fact that one of their manufacturing plants in Bryansk was uh, taken out. And one was down for at least several months after being damaged in, I think, Voronezh. Uh, they likely, as of the start of this month, uh, have a net total of about 5,400. So the 4,000 started with plus 1,400 manufactured since the war began. And they have, as of today, expended 4,250 of those. So uh, that would, in theory, one would assume from that 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 would mean, okay, they have 1,150 then that they could still use. Well, no, because remember, they also have other like units, other forces, other fleets elsewhere in other oceans and seas that they do want to like have those ships keep cruise missiles in their launchers. Now, accounting for their navies. Uh, there are other fleets. I added those up, and it comes out to a, roughly a bit over 400 cruise missiles would theoretically be in their launchers across those different vessels. So 
that would be 400 that could not really be used in the war unless Russia actually wanted to and was willing to bring itself to like pull those out of their launchers and bring them down to launch in Ukraine instead and leave itself with like no munitions in any of its other fleets. So that would thus mean only about 750 were available, plus whatever amount Russia wants to keep on hand uh, at various like air bases for various air launching uh, units, whether overseas in Syria or whether at different bases around the country. Uh, but I would think they'd probably be a bit more flippant with those, so that might only be like 100 or 200 which would mean you're looking at uh, something like only around 600, maybe, maybe 650 that Russia could still willingly throw away in Ukraine. And we finally got the first hint that Russia is actually starting to come down to a wall with those in terms of uh, what it knows it can affordably just expend. Because now, after all this time of striking hospitals and school children and apartment buildings, they actually struck meaningful targets for once. Uh, they struck, uh, they used a lot of them to strike a power plant uh, north of Kharkiv, uh, which was taken out. And uh, they tried to hit, uh, they tried to hit some. Uh, some command centers in Kiev, but those were shot down by air defense. So they are now actually trying to hit real targets, which, you know, is kind of indicative that they are no longer in a position to uh, re-handedly just throw, throw away cruise missiles uh, in any amounts. That's uh, just like uh, random children on a playground anymore. Now, by all means, they would prefer to be striking random children on a playground as opposed to actually, like, accomplishing goals in life, but uh, they're now uh, having their hand forced, so to speak. And uh, with the AFVs and IFVs, uh, so stuff like BMPs and things, uh, the total loss count on Russia's end is at now 4,300 uh, plus. Uh, that That's from their modernized fleet of IFVs and AFVs that existed before the war started, uh, plus an additional 700 to 800 or so ancient BMP-1s that were pulled out of old storage yards in Siberia and thrown onto the front lines. Uh, so they're whittling through those as well and starting to rely on those more and also starting to, you know, as you saw, use literal golf carts for their assaults. Uh, so they're at a total loss count from their modern fleet of IFEs and AFEs, uh, and their definition of modern is very loose. Uh, of 4,300 lost out of a starting fleet of about 5,600 plus theoretically 150 that have been built since uh since their uh their only IFE manufacturer was actually uh seized from uh the millionaire who was absconding with money uh and now that factory is supposedly actually producing modern BMP 3s or BMP 2s or whatever I guess uh or BTR A's uh, which is, you know, the BTR, but with uh, a large, like, 20 millimeter autocannon on top of it. Uh, theoretically, if they're telling the truth, then 150 fresh IFEs or AFEs have been manufactured, uh, which would bring the net total of the modern fleet to 5750, uh, which is not that much higher than, 40, than uh, 5600, uh, out of which now 4300 have been lost. Uh, and as I, you know, said, I suspect they're probably not really telling the truth about their total numbers. They're not obscenely lying. Uh, they don't tell like insane stuff like, say, North Korea does. 
but they seem to have a consistent pattern of overstating their like reserves of stuff by usually around like a quarter, like 20, 25 percent, sometimes 30 percent. So the 4,300 lost IFVs out of their modern fleet might be closer to their actual original total than it appears at face value, as constantly evidenced by the fact that they're now literally using things like golf carts on the front line. Uh, and then the artillery attrition has picked up uh, significantly over the last few weeks. They actually went uh, several weeks without losing too many SPGs. Uh, for those who don't know, SPGs is what modern artillery effectively is, which is uh, big self-propelled rolling howitzers. Uh, here we'll show the the U.S. one, for example. Uh, Russia's ones don't look exactly the same, but they do look similar enough. Uh, so this is modern artillery, uh, howitzers, rolling around, uh, you know, big, huge uh, hulking things, blasting out, you know, big, huge artillery shells. Uh, so at the start of the war, Russia theoretically had uh, over 1,600 SPGs. However, uh, that number is probably lower than that, although we don't know for certain, obviously. Uh, and since the start of the war, they have managed to manufacture a grand total of 24 new uh, howitzers. So 1,624 for the net total, out of which uh, their loss count is now closing in on 800. So if they are telling the absolute truth about their total numbers of those, they are approaching the point of having lost almost half of them. And uh, as I said before, they've lost around or just over 400 MLRS or rocket artillery pieces. Uh, most of theirs that they are resorting to using now are M21 grads. Uh, these... Yes, literally these ancient things, this is what they're using now, or rather what they were using, because now they're apparently starting to run a bit low. And there are a few possibilities behind this. First is that uh, since they didn't have as many like actual rockets for them, as much of that old ammunition as they thought they did, uh, you remember I said a, a number of months back they were turning to Iran and having Iran ship them a bunch of old grad rockets that uh, the Soviet Union gave Iran generations ago, uh, it looks like those supplies may be wearing out. That might be the reason. Uh, that's that's probably the most likely reason. But their total rocket artillery unit count might just not be what they claimed it was. Uh, they claimed to have 1,200 across all their different types of rocket artillery units, uh, whether old M M21 grads or whether they're, you know, infamous TOS. Uh, uh, not terms of service, but uh, uh, something in Russian that means flamethrower or whatever. Uh, but, but basically, you can call it uh, the terms of service uh, rocket launcher. Uh, the ones that, like, uh, Vatnik accounts on Twitter were, like, hyping up uh, before the war started, and uh, they had about 50, and they've lost uh, between 30 and 35 of them. So the, why can you never just give me the full-sized image? Yeah, these. Wait, this isn't copyright, is it? Uh, I don't see any Getty. Nope, no Getty images thing. Okay, so safe to use. Uh, but, you know, stuff like that as well. Uh, and the old grads and various different types of launchers. Uh, they supposedly had 1,200 units, and only around 400 have been lost in Ukraine. So, you know, in theory, there should still be another 800. And, uh, you know, we'll account for, like, uh, we'll account for some that they, you know, could never deploy because they want to keep some stationed at some of their, their bases, like in Syria, say, for instance. Uh, and uh, Tajikistan, one of their only other friends. 
Uh, so, you know, we'll say maybe they have uh, 50 to 100 stationed at like some of those places that they don't want to remove from there. That would still, you know, mean they should still have 700 of these things left. Uh, however, they're starting to uh, get a bit sparse with them. And even if we scroll down here far enough, I don't recall how far it was. We may have to scroll a long way down. Excuse me. Scroll, scroll, scroll. And we're scrolling, and we're scrolling. Can we keep scrolling, please? Thank you. And we're scrolling. Oh, wait, forgot about that. Also, oh. uh, their inability to maintain their own military equipment uh, continues. Uh, they're operating on a pattern of seemingly every week, sometimes every two weeks. Uh, one of their helicopters is just randomly having a full like engine failure seize up and just crashing on its own. Uh, so they are working on themselves on whittling down their uh, their own inventory. Uh, how far? Okay, I remember that one. Okay, so it might be close. It should be close, unless I'm completely miscalculating where I am. There it is. Okay, so uh, to supplement rocket artillery needs, uh, if you you might recognize these cylindrical rocket launcher things, uh, those used to be on uh, submarine hunting vessels. Uh, they would like fire a bunch of those rockets, and they were like set to dive a certain depth into the water and then explode. And they would explode in enough of like an area with all of them clustered together to effectively. Uh, make sure a, a submarines would uh, suffer some some degree of hull failure. Uh, so to compensate for lack of rocket artillery, Russia is st stripping these off of uh, old submarine hunting vessels and like bolting them onto the back of just trucks and uh, sending these up to the front lines. So, uh, yeah, the the evidence is becoming like increasingly blatant that uh it's just uh n nothing is really all there uh at home okay then we have the one other thing uh, i'll check chat first all right uh see you around then uh where we're oh yeah uh the one other thing of course the one other thing Wait, actually. Oh. Uh, sorry, friend. Thank you for the $5. I do have to uh, delete that, though. Uh, that particular uh, message as there's no uh, no vulgarities allowed on the channel, even if you remove a letter from it. Uh, Taiwan had a major earthquake. That's the big Taiwan news most recently. Uh, but amidst that, however, uh, while everyone's focused on that, China has been doing more Taiwan practice. Uh, they've done another series of rapid fleet deployments uh, maneuvers around the island and have been doing, uh, for the last week or so, several uh, wave incursions like this uh, in the assumably not same strike patterns they're going to make because they're probably trying to make Taiwan get used to those approach vectors, but then they're going to use completely different ones. Uh, but they have been doing uh, waves of like 30, uh, 30 combat aircraft at a time uh, going down on approach vectors towards Taiwan. Uh, so they are doing more practice. And as I've said before, this year, now that we're in this year, is the first year where the probability is above 50%. That this might actually be it. They might actually do it this year. The highest probability is still next year, though. Next year, 2025, is the highest probability. Like, it's 
effectively guaranteed. Uh, however, if they still don't do it in 2025, which would be really dumb, uh, then the final year they could manage it by is 2027. After which, Taiwan will have been uh, too well armed by us. The other situations over there, uh, the Ukraine stuff will have wrapped up. Uh, and we'll have been able to redirect even more focus over towards the Eastern Pacific. Uh, so China's best bet is next year, 2025, because uh, Taiwan will not have received everything we intend to give them yet. However, uh, it is it will have received a lot of stuff uh, already. But waiting an extra year or two from, you know, the initial 2022 uh, is was kind of necessary for China because that has allowed them to build a second amphibious assault ship fleet or major massive transit ship fleet. Uh, a lot of the uh, transportation is going to be done by converted civilian ferries. Uh, we've seen them in satellite images converting civilian ferries, hollowing them out, and making them ready to like load military equipment. Uh, I've I've even I've shown you guys uh, I've shown you guys those pictures a few times I think uh, like a year ago or something. Uh, and uh, and they've been like uh, welding and bolting like uh, air defense and SAM systems to like the the roofs of civilian of those civilian ferries and stuff. So they are going to use a lot of those. Uh, but instead of just the one amphibious assault fleet, they, by the end of this year, will actually have two amphibious assault fleets. Uh, so two groups of, I believe, uh, eight large landing ships from which the individual small ships that actually land on the beach then disembark. So uh, next year is when they will be the most ready. And that will... Uh, allow them also to, uh, we believe, reach a stock inventory of seven or eight thousand uh, cruise missiles and ballistic missiles, uh, both put together. And they also wanted uh, to wait until they had a more fully realized fleet of their uh, J-20 uh, semi-stealth fighters. It's not entirely stealth. Uh, cause, you know, this polk out stuff and that cut in the wind there and also having the engines like this, like the Russian version did, doesn't bode well. And, uh, also where's like some of the other error stuff. Uh, and also like the, they, they threw a bunch of like bumps and, and, and crap on the bottom here. Like, like look at, like, look at all this. Like, no, that's, that's not how, that's not how you do it. Uh, but I mean, they will be, you know, harder to lock onto than regular fighters, but they're not going to have like the like radar invisibility that the F-22 or the B-21 have. Uh, but they do have about a hundred of these now, which is one of the other things they were most likely waiting for, not to engage Taiwan. These there are hundred and there are hundred or hundred and twenty of these. These are for use against us because they know uh, that this one, this is not Ukraine. They know we will actually like intervene ourselves in this. Uh, like basically, uh, basically everybody, uh, military and, and non-military, uh, every everybody knows that uh, we will actually like fully step in with this one uh partially because one uh although china only stands a like five percent chance of succeeding we're not taking that five percent chance uh we are going to make sure they fail and uh letting we let ukraine play out on its own we're letting israel mostly play out on its own uh unless things turn really bad but at some point uh in terms of like uh, the philosophy of geopolitics, at some point psychologically, uh, you have to flex. Uh, you, at some point psychologically, you uh, uh, when two other people are fighting and you're supposed to keep the peace in the bar, 
you have to come up with uh, with a cinder block in your hand and smash one of the players over the head. Uh, so you have you have to do that eventually. Uh, and this is probably apparently going to be the one where we're going to do it. Uh, and also because China is the most like legitimate player now, now that we've exposed how actually pathetic Russia was, uh, China is the only one who's like theoretically still like legitimately a military power. And so as costly as it will be, they're the best one to make an example out of from the like uh, U.S.'s power projecting standpoint. Uh, uh, like breaking uh, breaking their nose or neck uh, will be, or like doing a throat punch and a kick to the nuts uh, is like the the highest uh, like power projecting move we could do. Uh, and it won't just be us. The, Phil- the, the Philippines are also going to throw in, despite how much uh, the Marco dude uh, says he's not going to, he is. Uh, Oz, the Aussies are going to be there with us uh, because uh, the thing about Aussies is they just love a fight. Uh, they love violence. I don't mean that uh, as anything against you guys, my lovely Aussie viewers, who I do seem to have a lot of apparently. Uh, but for some reason, uh, you guys just love violence. Uh, you always show up wherever the fight is, uh, whether it was World War I to uh, the Gulf War. You guys always show up eventually. Uh, and uh, Japan has said that they're throwing in uh, they are with us and actually uh, they're like fully on board uh, after especially we asked them back in the early 2010s if they could uh, come back because we did this to both Japan and Germany uh, because they had two different reactions uh, both view themselves as you know I was a bad boy uh, but Germany's reaction has been to sit in a corner crying to themselves for 80 years. I was a bad boy. I was a bad boy. And uh, we asked them, hey, can you uh, stop crying and actually, uh, you know, come back now? Uh, you know, can we get the uh, the military, the militarily strong Germany back? And their response has been to just sit there crying still. Whereas uh, Japan, post-war, instead of crying, did... What I would do, actually, uh, after uh, being humiliated in a way in which I legitimately was in the wrong, and that was just quietly not insert themselves into anything and just go back to work and do the utmost best job at their job that they could, which has been making cars and electronics. Uh, but we, uh, we, you know, with a sad, like, on head and, like, and sad, uh, regretful face, but we came to them in the early 2010s somewhat discreetly but not really and ask them hey can uh germany's not responding well can can you guys come back and japan uh put the power tools down and came right back uh they doubled the size of their military uh their navy uh is now technically the fourth uh, strongest navy in the world and honestly their military overall is probably at six or five at this point. Uh, and uh, they, they're even operating aircraft carriers again. Uh, so they responded when we asked them to come back. Because uh, we, you know, told them, hey, this is going to happen. We all know this is going to happen. Uh, it would be nice, you know, if it wasn't just us coming in uh, on top of Taiwan when this all happens. Uh, so they're in. Uh, the Philippines is secretly in. The Aussies are inevitably in because they always are. And South Korea is in because uh, South Korea has been longing for something to do militarily since North Korea never backs up its threats. Although, again, in the chaos of all this, North Korea might actually decide to pull something. In which case, we wouldn't have to do too much. South Korea would kind of be able to crush them on their own. Uh, although. A lot of people in South Korea would still die uh, from collateral damage, however brief the fight was, just because of how densely packed the peninsula is, and especially uh, how much uh, population density there is, uh, like, really close to the border. Uh, So, 
there would still be like a high collateral toll in South Korea. But even if we left South Korea by themselves and were busy like fighting China when North Korea decided to finally pull something uh, to finally make their joker move, South Korea would still be able to take them on their own just fine. But uh, what did that all stem from? Oh, yeah. Uh, China has been doing uh, more sets of 30 combat jets at a time, uh, practice uh, incursion waves, and uh, doing more uh, practice island surround naval maneuvers. So uh, that is, I think, everything. Let me double check. Uh, let's see. Got that. Got that. Uh, we got that. Yeah, it looks like that is everything. All right. Uh, so hopefully this one wasn't too long. An hour and a half. Okay, that's longer than I was intending it to be, but that's still uh, short enough. All right. Uh, so. I'll drink some water and wait around for a few minutes in case anybody asks anything or anybody else uh, super chats anything. Uh, but otherwise, that will then be it for this one. Let me drink this water. <laughs> uh, X off Google Earth. Stop consuming my uh, my processing power. Yeah, okay, give another I don't know thirty seconds. But thank you everybody for thank you, blah. thank you everybody. Uh, for showing up, and thank you, James, for the five bucks, and thank you, uh, Brandon. Uh, we have a new patron on Patreon. Uh, I'll find out tonight. Actually, when I get the email, I'll find out if uh, that charge actually went through. Uh, so, uh, thank you, Brandon, who just signed on to Patreon uh, as. Uh, a Persian Gulf level uh, member, Persian Gulf exporter. Uh, although running out of space in the Persian Gulf and the Persian Gulf exporter level doesn't apply to all Persian Gulf nations, just ones that have exorbitantly high export levels. Uh, so Russia does actually is counted in the Persian Gulf exporter level list, even though it's not in the Persian Gulf, but it has those levels of exports. Uh, so, Brandon got Russia because Alejandro has uh, Saudi Arabia, uh, Amon has Iraq, and Danny has the UAE. And then uh, uh, Josh is on there too. Uh, Josh got Kazakhstan. And I'm pretty sure all these names are up to date. I'm not entirely positive. Uh, sorry. Uh, Gabriel, I'm sorry your name is so small. I'll enlarge uh, your name and on up. All right, that's it then. So I will see you all around next time.